Okay, 11 o'clock Pacific time, right on the nose. Welcome everybody. This is gonna be a lot of fun, a conversation and a dialogue. Oops, and I'm letting people in as we go. Today, I am so chuffed, as they say in the UK, to be hosting this webinar. And we're going to have a very interesting presentation and then time for Q&A at the end. This is, how does AI change the nature of writing and translation? My name is Marina Grayson Farrell, and I have the extreme pleasure of introducing founder and CEO of Bureau Works, Gabriel Fairman. Hey, Gabriel, how are you doing? Thank you, Marina. Doing really well today. Pleasure being here with everybody. And like you said, hopefully we can keep what can be. I tend to make things very dense uh, and, and technical, and I'm, I'm very happy that you're here to keep me in check and encourage everybody to to ask questions and again this is a very exciting and at the same time new topic so yeah um, i i encourage and welcome any kinds of questions challenges it's uh it's good to think about all these things i spend most of my day thinking about this stuff uh, but i i always notice that questions and dialogues make you make me think differently about it and keep me on my toes. And it, this is a very collaborative effort on, on our behalf. So uh, yeah, uh, definitely want, want to hear from our audience as we go along. Absolutely. And and I, I'm glad that you, you mentioned that. I, I think anytime I'm in a presentation, I like to find out from the people, you know, at some point, what do you guys think about this? And what are your questions? And no question is silly. No question is the wrong question they're all right questions because this is a very time of introspection and learning about learning how does ai learn and how do all these things oh my gosh we've got some really good interesting mix of people coming in so i'm gonna keep opening the gates it looks like probably for the next few minutes we'll have more attendees join anybody that's come in you haven't missed anything we're just getting started and as Gabriel said, we're going to make it fun, lively, interactive, because that's what we do. And we're going to do Q&A at the end. So think about your questions for Q&A. We do have a place to enter your questions in Q&A, but we also have chat. All right. So are you ready, Gabriel? Show us what you have today, sir. I, I think like all humans, I was born ready, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But um, yeah, what, one thing, Marina, also wanted to ask um, everybody who's participating and speaks a language other than English, um, if, if people can list that in the, the chats, that's always helpful so that I can possibly try to include different languages in the demo um, and conversation. I'm, I'm particularly, I barely yes. speak as, uh, a little bit of Portuguese, so I'm going to focus on that um, because that's the the one language I think I can I can talk about with some level of um, mastery. But again, I'm I'm a linguist at heart, so I love uh, e even exploring languages that I'm not so comfortable in, as long as I'm guided by someone in the audience. So that's always very nice to hear. That's great, yeah, because I see German, Deutsch, and Portuguese, Spanish. Yeah, good. So you're going to get some interesting languages listed. Thanks. Very cool. Yeah, I'm seeing the All right, the go ahead, here. Gabriel. Yeah. All right. Let, let me share Perfect. my screen. Let me just make sure here. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, you're looking good. Perfect. All right. So I'm not going to bore everybody with slides, but um, just Today, we're, we're going to be talking about um, how does AI change the nature of writing and translating, right? It's a very, very broad question you can ask about, you can think about it in many different ways. But the, the key thing is I, I like to uh, talk about things in practice rather than in theory, just because I think, you know, we can spend all day talking about the possibilities and uh, you know, I love 
Um, as much as I love hearing myself speak and philosophizing about all this stuff, to me, what matters in the end is how does a translator or a content writer feel about this? How do they work with this? How does this take place in action? And uh, so on. So um, the basic thing that I want to explore, and I'll, 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 I'll put this here, this slide, right? I think the, it's a very gross oversimplification of where how I see things heading. And I think I, I, I can speak also based on my conversations with Enrique Van Nielsen and our, um, um, let's say, most senior technical people that I think the, the big opportunity I think that we see in the short term is to go from multiple drafts to single iteration with uh, pulverized recursive agile learning. I, I love big words, just making sound super smart. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, and I, and I'm coining this from Vanilson. Vanilson came up with this terminology. I think I, I distorted it a, a little bit, but the key thing is right. Just, just to explain, I think it's worth spending two minutes just explaining how, in my understanding, writing and translating typically goes right it's it's a drafting process you know when i write my first draft is really bad my second draft is less bad my third draft is a little less bad and eventually if i iterate enough and i let it sit for enough days and you know, maybe i'll ask henry to take a look at it and he'll spot some things and i'll get it better and you know eventually different people are going to look at it and okay it's good enough to run and but that's going to take multiple sets of eyes there's no learning on the fly you know maybe i'll learn from an edit here or there that someone made but it's it, it's 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 an asynchronous process right it's like i, I do my draft i share it with someone someone sends it back to me and we edit it and send it back and um and not only that but in the end i'll produce for instance a single piece of work right so i just published today for instance um uh, a Substack article on our generative language engine, and we'll share the link in, 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 in the chat. But basically, um, you know, what I wrote followed exactly this process: just multiple drafts, multiple sets of eyes, no learning on the fly, and in the end, I came up with a single post. Right? Where I, I, I and, and Henry's here on the call, uh, and I think for those as well, so they can correct me if I'm wrong. But basically, the way it, we see it going, the opportunity here is to do more in a single iteration, right? So instead of having to go through four or five drafts, the very first draft, maybe it's not gonna be perfect, but it's gonna be really good, right? And the, and the translation paradigm, instead of having to go through translation, separate sets of eyes, editing, separate set of eyes, proofreading, hopefully we can get to the point where the first set of eyes is already as good as going through three sets of eyes. And we're talking about learning on the fly. That's where I'm going to explain exactly what I mean by that. But the, I think one thing that's very clear is that we're, again, this is my opinion, but in my opinion is very clear that we're going to end up with ultra hyper local content. And again, this terminology, we can use different ways. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. So like, for instance, you know, my Substack uh, article today, um, I wrote it. And I would say, you know, if I had to define it, it's more towards the engineering academic crowd than to, you know, a non-localization person, right? My, my, my kids would be bored to death by the, the end of the first paragraph, basically. It's like, I wrote for a very particular audience in a very particular style. And one of the things that we're gonna see in my opinion is the same, this same article that I wrote, maybe would have 20, 30, different hyper local versions not only maybe translated into different languages but adapted specifically for the demographic that i'm looking for so maybe my same article would be written um, for um eighth graders you know and super simplified maybe not only less wordy less dense explaining the concepts in a more generic way um, i could also have it reworded for PhD uh, machine learning candidates that are really going to want to see it more technically rigorous. Um, and today, you know, with, with current tech, if we want to do that, it's a fairly laborious 
process, right? I would basically have to, e and e even leveraging something like uh, GPT, it's still going to require me to create new prompts, new drafts, revisit, right? And I think the direction where we see things going is that it's going to become easier and easier to create many, many different versions of a single piece of content, not only in, in the source language, but with the translations as well. So I'm we're, we're foreseeing a constant content explosion in that sense, because in the way we're foreseeing that is just because it's logical from a business perspective, right? Most content is trying to get people to do something, right? Like for instance, a support knowledge base article, we're getting trying to get people to learn how to use a tool or an e-commerce an e um, description or of an SKU, we're trying to get them to buy the product and inform them of it. But there's always an intent right, behind the text. And the closer that we get to narrowing the intent with the audience, the better the outcome, right? So um, there's a lot of value in that, in, in my opinion. But I'm gonna pause here just for one second before I start moving on to another thing. Seeing, I don't know, Marina, do, do you have any questions? Does anybody have any questions? No questions, but um, I'm fascinated about this learn on the fly aspect. And uh, so all the paradigm is really interesting, but definitely what, what does uh, the tool do? Learning, adapting, and then the fact that you can make a choice. Yeah. Those are a great question. So uh, I'm, I'm sharing Bureau Works now. Can everybody see my, my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so, and I'm, I'm going to demo things that uh, are very, very incipient. So this is uh, right now I'm in our, our DevOps environment. So this is not stuff that's uh, live, uh, av available in our production environment. This is stuff that we're still researching with playing with so but I, I do want to share the most cutting edge stuff just because I think for the purposes of the webinar it makes things more more interesting right so um and I'm gonna explain exactly what I mean by learning on the fly so if I click on this sentence for instance um and this was already a part of the glossary I I, I taught the engine um that I want it to translate it I want start to become an ISTE in Brazilian Portuguese and free to be sem custo. If I take a look at the machine translation, the machine translation is different. It says comes de graça. And I have a, a, a fuzzy match, right? Um, that says start for free now. Uh, th th that's the difference. So um, that's also not exactly the way I want it. Now, if I ask, so again, we, so we have another 100% match that says, so the key thing is, if you take a look at the machine translation, right, and take a close look at the translation memory, start is being described as comece, right? And free is being described as de graça, which is, it's, it, the, the, those are correct. These sentences are correct, right? It's not, they're not incorrect. Um, the agora is just emphasizing the idea of now, which can be implicit in the context, so it's not necessarily incorrect. So the TMs are correct, the machine translation is correct, but it's not aligned with the glossary. So if I ask AI to translate this, and I apply this translation, now it's in line with the glossary, and it's also taking into account, look, look at how this is where it gets super interesting, right? It's not just using machine translation because machine translation didn't have the agora piece, the now piece, but the translation memory had that. So it's learning and it's saying, okay, the glossary says A, the machine translation says B, the translation memory says C. How do I make sense of this and produce a feed that takes all of that into account, right? So that's a very powerful tool. And I'm Would talking about breaking up just a little bit. Okay, is it better now? Marina, is it better or am I yes. just breaking up here? Keep, okay, keep so, talking, keep okay, talking, continue. just a little so, tiny bit. Okay, yeah, but let me know if that happens again. Uh, so the, the, the key thing is even in both for writing and for translation, I'm contextualizing it more in translation, but the key thing that's important for us to bear in mind is that this is something very novel, right? In the past, yeah. 
what would have to happen is a, a translator would say would get this 100% feed and they would have to look at the glossary and say, oops, the glossary isn't aligning. So they would have to go here and like manually say, okay, this, and then they would have to change this to uh, this. And then they would be, okay, now I'll confirm, but look at the time it took me to look at the glossary, implement the glossary, and now reread the sentence only to confirm. Whereas with, again, with AI, I'm there right now, right? So you arrive at the same result with a lot less manual effort. And uh, I wanna pause here because I think this concept is key. I wanna make sure that it's clear to everybody and see if anybody has any questions around this idea of being able to take different sources of information and make sense of it. Yes, anybody have any questions? I know this is super interesting. What, uh, let's see, Karen? So why not you could come off of your mute? Okay. All right. So Keep going. I'll, 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 I'll go on. So the other thing that's happening here is um, we've implemented something that's called translation smells. And this is very, very, very beta, but um, it's very new. Um, but this is what's going to happen, right? Let's let's remove the same cool Let's say I made a mistake, right? I, I it just says now if we back translate this into English, it's saying start now. It's missing the for free components. And now the translation smells in this case isn't detecting a problem, but there is a problem. So let's ask AI to translate it. Let's apply it, and that's all good. But let's take another example, and let's change this verb here that's confio means trust which is correct here for english um and let's change this for uh, Lord. okay not detecting a smell let's see if right now hmm, interesting the smells are not detecting something again this is super new so I'm, I'm, I'm expecting this kind of behavior but anyway the, the 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 point what we're implementing the idea with smells is let me see if i get it in a different se segment hmm. yeah we need to see, see why smells is not smelling so but the idea is uh -huh. I right. just wanted to say real quick, Boriana just now uh, joined and I see a couple others coming in. So this is a new aspect uh, that you're researching and this is called translation smells. If somebody were to come in and they didn't see what's going on, can you uh, reiterate this is a process of looking at glossary, TM, MT, and AI suggests? Yeah, th those are different different things like one mechanism just to recap right let me get, grab here a sentence and in this case we don't have let me get different. one one that's uh here okay great and i do see questions coming in this is great So just to go back on the first example, right? We're, we're talking about yep. being able to teach the engine. In this case, for instance, we have a 101% transition memory match. And then we also have... Uh, Everybody mute, please. I think you can mute. Thanks. Go ahead, Gabriel. Okay. Let me see if it's yeah. Going. I'll do that. Okay. Got so, it. So, um, all right. So, going back here, right? Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to teach the platform on the fly, right? So let's grab a segment here, for instance, uh, and there's a seventy-two percent translation memory match, a machine translation, 
and a few terms that are present in the glossary, right? You can see that what's present in the feed is not respecting the glossary, right? So engagement models in the glossary, we're defining it as tipos de uso. In this case, it's casos de uso, right? Uh, use case breadth is being defined as abrangência de casos de uso. In this case, it's amplitude. So the language is different. Let's ask AI to translate this. And again, apply the translation, go back. And you can see here, now the highlighting changed completely because it's using the terminology that is in the glossary. In this case, it's in the glossary, but I can teach it on the fly, right? So for instance, here, let's say you have something in the machine translation that's suggesting comesa de graça, start is in C. Let's define that we want free to be in this context gratuitamente. And it's already self-identifying this as an adjective, right? So let's save that replace it. Now I have this added to my glossary. Let's ask AI to translate this. And boom, it's already adapting to what I'm teaching. Right? So the first concept is we're talking about taking information from many different sources or contexts and merging it together into a single source that makes sense. Um, and again, I, I do want to pause before I move to the next thing because this is a key concept and for people that are not necessarily working translating or very heavily in localization maybe it doesn't seem that groundbreaking but we're talking about hours and hours and hours and hours of work that become um unnecessary right you're starting off from a, a, a draft that's much better than what's currently available through machine translation and transition methods cool Okay, so the second component is you can ask AI to review this segment and AI is suggesting comesse de graça, which is different than what I have, right? I have MC gratuitamente and it's explaining that the suggested translation is more natural and idiomatic in Brazilian Portuguese. The verb iniciar is more formal and less commonly used in começar in this context. And it's right. It, it, the, the, in this, in, 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 in this uh, situation, I do believe that the feed is correct. So let's say I, I decide to implement that and I can confirm the segment and it's identifying a glossary mismatch because the AI suggestion, just to make sure that we're explaining clearly, the AI suggestion that I just asked is not taking into account translation memory and glossaries for a reason, right? We want this to be like a second pair of eyes that, 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 that would be closer to a reader, right? A, a reader of a translation, a reader of a text that's authored, they don't have access to a translation memory or a glossary. They couldn't care less. They care about readability, right? Does this sound well? So that's, that's how we did this AI review tool. The question is, does it sound well? And obviously we can take this further in the sense that we can create, for instance, um, personas and adjust this to demographics. But the idea is you can have a second pair of eyes work with you as you're translating, right? So we're talking about teaching the glossary terms on the fly. We're talking about having a second pair of eyes um, while you're uh, translating, which in essence makes a lot more um, room for focusing on readability, intelligibility, hyper, focusing content as opposed to is it translated or not or does it have errors or not I, I think the idea is we'll be able to be we'll be able to more often than not have fewer 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 errors so that we can start to focus more and more on how on performance versus the idea of error eradication And um, I'm seeing some questions here uh, in, in the chats. Yeah, so um, there's a couple questions from Arcadio. Hi, Arcadio. Great to see you. And so 
he's asking as hi <laughs> he sends a, uh, right back there in chat so his question is as linguists apply changes to the translation how does ai keep up with them especially if some are conflicting so you've already shown mm -hmm. uh the conflict and it sends out a warning um what would you say gabriel how does ai keep up with them yeah so what's happening in the background is there are a lot of natural language processing techniques around how we're processing documents into bureau works, breaking down uh, sentences into tokens. There's a lot of indexation that's happening around glossaries and around TMs. And essentially, all of this machine learning is teaching um, a large language model. In this case, it's GPT-3, 3.5 and 4 combination of those to make sense of all of those different contexts. As far as conflicts go, um, that's a great question, Arcadio. One of the key things that I think people aren't that used to, and I'll show, see if I can show up and show an example, is that um, these large language models, they're prob probabilistic engines, so they're not deterministic. So in the sense that if you suggest something that goes directly against, let's say, a very clear syntactical rule of grammar or something that the, the, the engine believes should be overridden, it will override it, but it's not necessarily uh, that it will perform the same way in every case. It's always going to make a probabilistic decision based on the level of conflict. So let me see if I can push the boundaries here with an example to show this. So in this sentence, for instance, um, I have three different glossary terms. And in this case here, let's let's take a look at the the machine trend at the the, the, the one hundred and one feed is saying that luz através do nosso motor do gerenci por própria por conta própria. The glossary that we have is saying that engine should be ingenio and manage should be administri as opposed to gerenci. It's all synonymous in some ways, but different than what's in the feed. And this is another age old problem in localization. So what happens when the transition memory feed, especially 100 and 101% matches, because people don't want to have to be paying again and again for these sentences to be reviewed. What happens when they're in conflict with the glossary, right? If I ask AI to yep. translate it, it's going to consider the 101% feed, but it's also going to take into account the glossary and it's going to change that feed now that same 101% feed was upgraded, let's say my, my opinion was upgraded so that it's also consistent with the glossary. Now I can confirm that. So that, that's a very uh, powerful application. So we're talking about in, in this particular example, right? Just between the possibility of um, A, teaching the engine, B, merging different sources of information together, C, asking for a different set of lies all in the same kind of iteration right it's like all prior to confirming this segment takes me a lot further already as it is than it would in a traditional environment where a translator would get a tm feed have to adapt it based on the tm differences then adapt it based on the glossary then think about it from a readability perspective like all and and then obviously because of that, that's going to require a review step or someone else is going to have to look at it. So we're trying to encapsulate what typically takes place today in several different steps in a, a single, more concentrated iteration. Cool. Good. And, and on the heels of that, uh, mm -hmm. Arcadio has a, a similar question. Uh, the AI will adopt new wording based on the input it received. Does it have impact on TM or only in AI future suggestions? But you've shown how you can blend. What, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So in this case, for instance, it's a great question. It has an impact in both, right? In this case, when I confirmed the segment, now it's going to let me refresh my screen. Go back to segment 10. So now it, it's going to show up also as a TM feed, the, the, the updated, let's see if I confirm the segments, yep, I did. Uh, it's also going to show up as a TM feed and it's also going to um, 
so it's, the learning is taking place essentially if i can be more technical about it it's taking place when you're storing the updated tm feed in the in in in, in in, in the transition memory and every time you interact again with the ai the ai is going to have that most updated version of the tm as well as the tm change history so it's taking again we're trying to expand the number of different information sources so that ai has the most amount of relevant information possible to make a good decision cool cool um Arcadio, does that answer your question i think that was really interesting examples and understood thanks he says so gabriel something you said um earlier today what was it writing is the process of self-reflection and learning so mm -hmm. using this you uh get the suggest you 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 write your translation you get the suggestions you reflect on it and you make a choice did, did you want to talk about that analogy of the self-reflection yeah, I think uh, I, I was writing about that last night, it's, and it, it, to me, it's one of the most fascinating prospects of where we're heading. Right? We're like, and, and connecting this to what Arcadio was saying. Right? We're typically used to very rigid structures of knowledge. Right? The translation memory, for instance, it only knows exactly what you teach it. So, a translation unit is going to have a sentence in let's say English, the translate another sentence in Portuguese, maybe a little bit of metadata that's just like a timestamp, an author, maybe a little bit more like the, the file name or something, but just good. it's basically gonna have, you know, the the sentence in English, the sentence in the target language, and a little bit of metadata around it, right? That's what the translation memory knows. It only knows very specifically what you're teaching. So as a metaphor, it's kind of like if you're a student and you're just listening to what a teacher is telling you. So the teacher is telling you, you know, saying words and you're just listening to the words, right? With AI, because we're opening to different sources of information and context, it's like you're a student, but you're not just listening to the words, you're observing the demeanor, the tone, uh, you're noticing. Um, the fascination around certain points of the lecture you're looking at other students around you and seeing how they're thinking about how they're reacting to the lecture and you're taking notes and you're taking notes and you're reflecting on those notes and improving on your note taking and the way you take notes also changes the way you focus on the material ahead of you i mean it, it huh. it's a metaphor but essentially yeah. what's what i'm describing is that learning when you begin to reflect not when you begin to add to do two things add more sources of information and b reflect across those sources of information learning becomes a much more dynamic and more interesting um experience right so the idea is very analogous here is that you know you're you're, you're not just looking at the machine translation in a one-to-one -one correspondence is you're looking at the machine translation okay that's one source of information you're looking at the transition memory that's another source of information you're looking at the glossary that's a third source of information you're looking at past changes that were made that's another source of information you're looking at the domain you're looking at the text intent you're looking at so many different things so that you're essentially fluidifying what well, used to be a very rigid database now is more like a living and breathing database if that makes sense mm, cool <laughs> very cool thanks for for that and oh thanks karen thanks for coming karen says fascinating mm -hmm. stuff she's got to go and and just to illustrate here another application of this right is uh one thing that happens a lot in translations is we we have to make changes and we have to understand why those changes are being made right okay uh and in this case for instance uh let's say the the, the translation was wrong right and um let's say i um want to it says built-in terminology management the machine translation is correct but the whatever the translator entered doesn't match so let, let's ask ai to 
uh, translate this and see what it does. Okay, it's, it's suggesting, you can see here, this is a very good example, is in the translation memory, it's suggesting the verbiage integrado, which is literally integrated, and it's coming up on its own with this idea of embuchido, which may or may not be good, but that's what the AI suggested. And it goes back to Arcadia's example. It's like, in this case, it made a decision that's conflicting with the verbiage in the transition memory, right? And what, I don't know if it was, everybody was able to know this, but the, the change categorization and the explanation was done by AI. So I, as a human, I can, I can re review that and, and uh, say, okay, that I agree that it's fluency, but, uh, and I can also add that say, Imbuchida uh, sounds uh, less formal and is better mm. for our demographic. But even there, I'm not working from scratch. I'm working from um, a, uh, I'm working from starting point, right? It's like the, let me make another change here at C. Uh, so let's say here it says Masa Plataforma. Let's remove the word Nives here to see what it says. And now it's going to probably categorize as an incorrect translation. And it says, look, it's calling out my error. The review translation is missing the verb in Plega, which is present in the source text in the initial translation. The omission changes the meaning of the sentence and makes it incomplete, which is correct, right? So the the it's not just cataloging errors. It's even identifying in this process, it's unintentionally identifying errors in my own editing process. So, and again, it may, uh, the, the, the important thing to keep in mind about AI and these large language models is that it's not deterministic, right? It's not gonna work the same in 100% of the cases. It's gonna work differently here and there because it's so sensitive to context, right? So again, the Imbuchido was a really good example where in, in its, opinion contextually it decided to override verbiage in the tm and that's where i think that um it, things start to get interesting right because from a knowledge management perspective most people that works with work with transition memories are very very adamant about always adhering to transition memory because there's this fear of loss of quality if you're not adhering to transition memory but if you think about it from a writing perspective, it makes more sense that the translation memory should be an ever evolving, ever iterating process, as opposed to a static thing where you like, you have a feed from let's say 1985 that keeps propagating in 2023 and nobody <laughs> checks it because it's a 101% match. Mm -hmm. with, this with this kind of technology, you're able to keep TM matches fresh without adding um incredibly to the translation cost and by cost i mean the most abstract sense of cost like time efforts anything that creates you know added cost in that cool interesting yeah and uh along the same lines what arcadia was asking boriana asked are requests and queries stored in any way in terms of reusing them well you can blend them and then bring them back what would you say to that? Yeah, so again, this is a good example. So the machine translation wasn't able to understand that Bureau Works was mm -hmm. a proper noun. So it literally translated Bureau Works as a, a bureau that works. Uh, and it <laughs> didn't translate the word trust because the machine translation understood that the company name was Trust Bureau. Uh, but when I translated it through AI and it's learning from the glossary, now I apply that translation and it's going to also categorize the change here and it says uh huh. the explanation in this case isn't that good the review transition improves the sound tone that's correct uh but it's focusing on the fact that i'm using lowercase letters for empresas instead of focusing on the most important thing which was the fact that uh there was an incorrect translation right and in this case um i, I should explain what it was bureau works was incorrectly translated and should have been a DNT. 
Um, so I'll mark that as reviewed now. And essentially, again, going back to Borgana's question, now that I stored this in the translation memory, that's that's always going to be teaching the engine as we go along. Perfect. Boriana, does that answer your question? And others that have questions, oh, let's see. Oh, across other projects as well, Gabriel. Does that apply? Yes. Hi, Any sorry. <laughs> Hi, I, yeah. I, I was typing because it's almost 9 p.m. Uh, but oh. yeah, I wanted to <laughs> ask, like, can these queries be reused? Because, you know, some types of errors are very repetitive. The proper noun was a good example, and it happens often. So, you know, how, is there a way to start the to start the queries in terms of prompting it so that we can reuse across other projects or other PMs and not yeah. redo it every time on every project and, you know, other customer that we may have internal, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Well, um, thinking particularly about bureau work, right, in our knowledge management structure, we have the account level, that's the highest level. Then you have the organizational level, that's one level below. And then you have organizational units, so that's one level below. And then you have the projects, that's one level below. So we have like an information management hierarchy that we follow. So um, let's say if you store your glossary at the organization level, so uh, and you have several different clients that belong to that organization, several different organizational units, every organizational unit can refer to that glossary, right? So in the, in, in the example here that I just gave, when you when I taught uh, the engine over here, when I taught, taught the engine that Bureau Works was a proper noun here in the glossary, now it learns that. And if that glossary is shared with other projects, it will know that. So again, it's just a matter of making sure that whenever a project is created, that it's creating created within the knowledge hierarchy in Bureau Works so that it's leveraging that, that same glossary, right? As long as you're leveraging that same informational source, it's always gonna leverage that. Same thing with the TM, right? Because I confirmed this segment, now the translation memory also knows that Bureau Works shouldn't be translated. So uh, if I get a fuzzy match, it's gonna, it, it's gonna pick up from that knowledge as well. So as far as sharing, it's just a matter of you deciding exactly if you wanna keep, let's say one glossary per client, or if you wanna share glossaries across clients, or across organizations, across divisions, across departments, it's, it's more of a information management decision that's up to each and every user of your works than something that's proposed by us. Cool. Oh, great. She says, thanks, Gabriel. Reusable per level and settings. All right. Yep. And um, over here, I think I, I was trying to show earlier, this is another level of uh, AI, which is what we call translation smells. And this was something that I wasn't getting the right example to show you previously, but you have the idea of language services that was translated following the glossary and you can see here, like you had something in the in the transition memory that was a hundred percent match that says "servicio de inglés," which is uh, textually correct but sounds really weird. Uh, and in this case, it made sense for our website, let's say in Portuguese, to communicate language services as translation services. That's just because so how people in Brazil would are more, most likely to understand what is it we do. But our AI smells is detecting a potential inaccurate translation. And the reason for that is exactly, it's explaining here, language services refer to a broader range of services related to language, including translation, interpretation, language training, and more. Servicio de Tabson only refers to translation services. So it's alerting me as a translator that my translation may be wrong. But it, it, one very important concept that I always learned from our, our head of software engineering, Vinosan, is that um, the idea of smells is able to detect a potential error, but it's not at the point where it can assure that something is right. So not having something smell doesn't mean that it's right 100% of the time, but it's a very high indication that it's probably right. So that's, uh, the, again, it, that's one of the key things when I think about limitations around AI, 
one of the key limitations I think is that most people are used to probabilistic engines, right? It's kind of like, is this right? Yes or no? You know, when I, when we were developing this feature, I was ta talking to Melissa about, about the idea of thinking about the stoplight, right? It's like, is it red? Is it wrong? Is it yellow? Is it maybe wrong? Or is it green? Is it right? We don't have that level of certainty with AI, at least not yet. We have like, oh, there's a high probability that there may be an error. And in this case, from a textual perspective, the error flag was correct. From a contextual perspective, we want this translation to be exactly how it is, right? So I'm gonna pause, see if anybody has any questions here around this mouse. Yeah, this is interesting because I, I uh, kind of just threw out private chat and asking any questions and the uh, response is so interesting, still absorbing it. So um, <laughs> I think this is just kind of like a new era in so many ways that you know, I think once people start working with it, and then they'll have the actual questions. But uh, so, so the way you're talking about this, the probabilistic engine, people are not used to it. And what you're talking about, self reflection and learning. So if people keep using it, translators keep using it and keep um, influencing through their choices, Therefore, it becomes more natural language processing, understanding, and learning from that. So you, the more you use, the better it gets. True. The, the more you use, the more it learns from you, and the, the, yeah. the more aligned it becomes. More aligned. That's a whole other issue on AI alignment. It's a really big discussion. But at least for our purposes, the more you use it, the more aligned uh, the, the engine becomes to your way of thinking. And, and, and again, from, from my perspective, what's really cool is, for instance, when I translate, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very anxious. I mean, I don't, I don't want to make mistakes and I reread things again and again. But honestly, if you're working on a document that's like 5,000 words or 6,000 words, by the time you're like halfway through, my brain at least isn't as reliable as it was when I was first beginning. You know, there's some things that I... Uh, yesterday, I wrote a, a document and Henry took a look at it and said, yeah, you're, you're, you're repeating a word. My eye didn't catch it. And I reread the document two or three times. Uh, Grammarly didn't catch it. It wasn't necessarily a mistake, but it, it sounded clumsy. Um, and with stuff like this, and obviously this is very incipient, right? But I'm able to write more confidently because I'm less focused on preventing errors because I know that AI can help me understand flag these errors for me so i'm i feel and this again this is a very subjective experience but my experience using this is i feel less worried about making mistakes and i feel more focused on creating good text um, okay. and that to me is really the potential thing right it's like leave error detection more for machines so that humans can be more creative oh my gosh and isn't that the point letting humans be creative and therefore not losing their jobs, <laughs> you know, because this is a, a dialogue with a tool that that's helping you and learning from you. Uh, so keeping the humanity into it. I, I love that. So, uh, yeah, it looks like we're uh, getting into the latter part of your presentation, a, a little less than 15 minutes left for the Q&A. Uh, everybody shout out some questions. How would you see this working in the projects you're in right now. Anybody have some thoughts on that? I think this is, yeah, so new and uh, such a, a tweak of the way we think. Uh, I think Gabriel will wanna keep seeing more and more and, and then the new uh, things that are coming out. Oh, hello. Somebody asking a question. Maybe that was the background. And okay. while people are thinking about questions, this is another example of smells like. Notice how, how different this smelled an incorrect translation on the segment I was showing. Now this new segment is showing a problem of translation accuracy. And it's saying the translation is accurate, but the word serenity was translated as tranquilidad, where it may not convey the exact meaning. A better translation could be serenidad. So it's it's alerting me that the, the verbiage I'm using could create a translation accuracy problem. And again, as, as a 
an author, I'm not forced to take this recommendation, but I can have more peace of mind knowing that there's something else looking over my work. Um, again, in this case, for instance, and I'm going to go through a few segments just to show, yeah, I'm trans translating through AI and at the same time not finding a uh, smell. Um, but let's say, for instance, I don't like this idea of reborn in Portuguese, and let's add the term. Again, it's identifying it as, a, as, as, as an adjective in this context. And again, this is something that's very interesting because reborn could be a verb too, but it's identifying in this structure as an adjective, as an adjective phrase. So again, it's not just labeling things randomly. Is this a verb? Is this an adjective? It's trying to understand in this context what is this word doing, and let's call this Hisujida. We added it to the glossary. Let's ask AI to translate it. And again, it's a using my terminology. And let's see if smells pick up on something. And smells is saying this is awkward. Saying the translation is technically correct, but the use of the word Hisujida, which was uh, what I suggested, is uh, may sound strange or awkward in this context. A better translation could be revitalizada or renovada. It's a very good example, right? It's like the TM suggested one thing, the MT suggested another thing, the glossary suggested a third thing, I suggested a fourth thing, AI suggested a fifth thing, all in the same interaction, right? So we're seeing a lot more things happen within a single interaction, right? So the richness, when I confirm the segment, I'm confirming this with a lot more certainty than I would if I was just rel relying on my own set of eyes or my own set of eyes in the transition memory. Excellent. Okay. And um, I see there was another couple of languages suggested. Can you switch to Spanish, European Spanish, yes. and Let's see what see happens? That. So those in the audience that are Spanish speakers, uh, come and pick this apart. What do you think? Perfect. Yeah, let's do that. So let's create a web preview here for Euroworks. Okay. So in this case, for instance, let's uh, the translation. I don't have uh, added context in, Sp in, in Spanish here, but let's say, for instance, the machine translation is saying gestiona las traducciones a tu manera. And uh, let's say. I want to say this different. Uh, let's call manage. Let's call, and again, it's identifying by AI that's a verb. Let's call this administre. And let's add this. Perfect. Let's ask AI to translate that. And boom, now it's, and it's identifying. Look, oh, cool. It applied the glossary. It's applying, uh, identifying now a potential tone in this map. So the original text uses a formal tone, while the translation uses an informal tone. Um, consider using a more formal tone to match your original text. I don't necessarily agree with this, but again, second pair of eyes. If I want a third pair of eyes, let's ask AI to take a look at how it would suggest it. And it's saying, gerencia las traducciones a tu manera, which is entirely different from what we have in the glossary and the machine translation. Let's see how it smells this, just as curious. And it's saying that the verb is incorrect. It's saying the verb gerencia is not commonly used in Spanish to refer to manage. A more appropriate verb would be gestiona. And again, I, 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 I really wanna spend just a minute on this because we're not, we're seeing the same model disagree with itself again and again mm -hmm. yeah and 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 that's learning right and what we're what i'm used to what i grew up with as far as a database goes is like again if i if i teach a database that the word apple is manzana in spanish every time i type the word apple it's going to tell me manzana and what we're talking about in ai it's it there's going to be a very high probability that apple means manzana but it's going to be aware of the context and it's likely that if i'm talking about apple the brand it's not going to say manzana yeah. it's going to say apple mm -hmm. so uh that's what's so cool right and, and 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 the idea that from because you're talking about things from a probabilistic and contextual perspective 
depending on the context, you're gonna get very different results. So in this case, for instance, when the, our transition smells is using certain context that the AI suggestion isn't using. So naturally the suggestions are very different. Um, and because of that, there's a richness in learning in my experience as a translator, I'm getting the possibility in a single iteration to work with lots of different uh, perspectives and angles. So in my opinion, it really enriches the entire writing experience. Mm, fair enough. Good to see that in Spanish. All right, other questions? Just a few more minutes left. I think we have six minutes. All right, then the difficult, so quote unquote difficult languages. The languages that have so many different cases and so forth. How do mm -hmm. we deal with those? I saw a really active conversation uh, the other day with our group, and they were talking mm -hmm. about Hungarian or things like that. Uh, yeah, let's take a look in Arabic just as an example. Okay. But we have we have videos that we're going to share uh, about how it works in all kinds of languages because that's one of the things we really research on. Uh, and so far, performance has been very good across <laughs> languages, I think. Um, so let, let's show here. And again, I, I, don't, I can't read any Arabic, I can't speak any Arabic, but yep. let's just see what happens. Um, but it, essentially, it's getting the machine translation as a feed, it's suggesting another, and it's running smells in Arabic. Let's see if, if we get a case where we have a divergence between uh, the AI suggestion and the transition smells. See, it's picking up in Arabic and it's saying the transition is accurate, but the meaning of engagement models and use case breadth may not be clear to the Arabic speaking audience and may be helpful to provide additional context or explanation. So same same concept across languages. Um, you know, we can take a look at it in uh, simplified Chinese as well. Let's take a look at in traditional Chinese actually. Let's take a look here in traditional Chinese as an example. And again, I think we have just a few more minutes. Um, uh -huh. and happy to entertain any questions. Okay. The same same concept here in traditional Chinese. It's implementing the machine translation, the AI, and it's looking for things and smells and it's identifying, in this case, that the transition is accuracy, no issues is found. Uh, let's see if we find something where we do flag an issue. It's suggesting a grammatical error. The transition is not grammatically correct. A more accurate translation would be boom. So I can copy and paste that into the editor. And I, I made a mistake, probably I'm missing something here as far as the quote goes. But yeah, that's the, the, the idea. The concept is exactly the same. As far as linguistic sensitivity, it works really well with different languages. Obviously, some what it does vary, for instance, according to content type, you know, for marketing, it's going to be, I particularly like it for marketing just because it gives me this second set of eyes, this different way of expressing the same things. But it works really well for engineering techs. It works really well for pharmaceutical techs. It works really well. Huh. I, I see the main difference, particularly the more complex content becomes, the more metaphors, the more idioms, the better this performs, the more useful it is as a tool. Oh my gosh, say that again. So the more complex, the more metaphors used, and idioms. you're talking idioms. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, okay. because then, you know, you're having. In an engineering manual, for instance, nobody cares, let's say, if you're talking, if you're expressing that same sentence in the most readable or a little bit less readable way, because it's technical. But if this were a marketing transition, which it is, and it's in, in detecting to me an inconsistency in tone and it's saying the transition switches between formal and informal, that's really relevant information for me as a translator or writer. And I can think about that. I can reflect on that and I can improve on that. And when I do do that, it's going to store in my transition memory that 
let's say improved um, writing. So it's going to learn yeah. from that. And then the next time it's going to be a little bit better. So it's, we're always iterating over content as opposed to just translating it, storing it and la leaving it to become stale and dead. Yeah, right. Very good. Okay, great. And we got two minutes, one minute left. And there's a real important question I think you really should uh, uh, dive into, Gabriel. And then also if you could put the link to your article from your Substack oh, yes. into the chat. I don't think I have that. So let me read this question to you because Marwa, there's no silly questions. So Marwa says, should we expect to start working with AI on company trained platforms or or we might be able to buy user platforms? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it's going to come from both ends. BureauWorks does have a user license that starts at $9 a month that has uh, the ability of uh, activating the AI capability. We are very wary of uh, uh, privacy and content sensitivity, so you do have to opt in to sharing your data with OpenAI and Microsoft Azure. Uh, encrypted, it gets destroyed after 30 days. Me personally, I'm very comfortable with data in Microsoft Azure and OpenAI, much more than I am so with, for instance, using Gmail. But a lot of people have a lot of resistance towards privacy, and that's also in my Substack. But uh, that is the key thing, is to be able to leverage this, uh, you do need to opt in to sharing your data with OpenAI and Microsoft Azure. That does not use that for training purposes. They just store it for 30 days and then it gets permanently deleted. And you can read more about it in their own privacy policy. That, that's okay. Thanks for, for mentioning that because we have seen concerns about privacy uh, and just kind of going around in all of our conversations. So, yep. oh, good. Okay. So there, Ugo has put the link, the latest article in the chat. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Ugo. Perfect. Very cool. Oh, we're actually a minute over. I think has everybody got anyone has any other questions, throw them in the chat and Gabriel, I'm sure you'll be happy to follow up. And yeah, everybody. Absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. Interesting. We had a lot of uh, thank yous in the chat and very interesting stuff. And thanks for your time showing exactly how this looks and exactly how it's working and where it's going. I think that is oh, so thank fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marina, for, for being such a gracious host. It's so much nicer to, to do a webinar with you than it is <laughs> trying to run it on my own. So very grateful for your presence here today. And very, oh, well, thank, thank you very you. much for everybody for watching and really look forward to interacting with everybody, thinking about this. And again, every week I'm trying to publish something on Substack because it makes me more and more um, uh, interested in thoughtful and again i'm learning every day as we go through absolutely thank you thanks everybody for coming and uh yeah oh yeah very good and so good to be talking about all this and having everybody together on these topics all right take care everybody bye-bye see you next time keep coming back to these interesting di dialogues we're gonna pick this apart we're gonna pick your brain there gabriel see you guys okay let's do it all right thank you everybody See bye you. Bye-bye. See ya.